everybody enjoyed that video. Isn't that pretty powerful? Yeah. So, um, you know, when, when, you get, when I get material for a talk, it comes from different places. And, and I have, I want to begin with a quote today, and it comes from a person I never ever thought would give me a quote for a message. Um, Becky and I have a granddaughter that's a real wild child. Um, in fact, I was saying to Becky today, she takes after her father, um, my son. Anyway, on her Facebook page today, she had this quote, you were given this life because you're strong enough to live it. Um, so maybe she's turning into a philosopher. So Ernest Holmes, who, who um, founded the Centers for Spiritual Living, in one of his books, talks a lot about Jesus. And, and so, by the way, I want to speak about, the, the title today is The Obstacles Are the Path. And so Holmes says about Jesus, he said, you know, Jesus said very little about negative conditions that, that he wish, wished to change. He, he, um, he didn't tell God how there was sickness and people were poor and, and they were famished. He didn't, he didn't go to God with that. In fact, Holmes said he did just the opposite. He, he, um, he told the lame to walk, he told the blind to see, he told the dumb to speak. He told the deaf to hear. So he did just the opposite of bringing his problems to, uh, to, to God. In fact, Michael Beckwood said something one time about, I don't bring my, my problems to God. I bring my big God to my, to my problems. Um, but, but in the Bible, there's a story about the Pharisees coming to Jesus at some point, and, and they, want, they want to... Um, they want to try to, um, not exactly to fool him, but to catch him. And so they bring with them somebody who's been blind since birth. And they say to Jesus, so here we have this man who's been blind since birth. Tell us, is he blind because of some mistake he made in another life? Because they believed in reincarnation. Or is he blind because he's because of the sins of his parents and Jesus um, says to him what difference does it make who cares um, the power of it he didn't say it exactly like that but the power the power if he was born in the Bronx he would have said it like that the, 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 he, he said the power of God is sufficient um, over all mistakes and he said, it doesn't matter when the mistake was made. What matters is the point of time it was corrected. And when I read that this week, I thought, so what's, what's the right time to be the point of time it was corrected? And the answer is now, in, in the present. That's the only time that we really have. And that's the only time that anything can be corrected. And Holmes wrote, um, that which thought has done, thought can undo. So, you know, there's a really positive message there saying, you know, if we've got obstacles in our life and we're facing tough times, we, we can move, we can move beyond that. So there's a, a fable about a city years ago that was very famous for its fragile and exquisite porcelain, particularly its urns. And when an artist would make an urn, when it was seemingly all complete, there was one more step that the artist needed to take. And that step was to break it. And then the artist would put it back together again with gold filigree. And what would happen is an ordinary urn was turned in to a precious work of art. And the point is, what seemed finished wasn't until it was broken. And you know, within every obstacle, within every obstacle is an opportunity to, to improve 
upon our condition. And so I, I just mentioned Michael Beckwith, and uh, I was reading one of his books this week, and in the book he says he believes that there's something within each of us that knows that challenges in our life are great, great awakeners, he calls them, great awakeners. And he said what they do, they, they disrupt our opinions, they cause our consciousness to open and to let in new thoughts, new ideas, new perceptions, and, and new points of view. And he said, sometimes the bigger the challenge that we face, the greater the insight and the greater the resulting happiness. And, and he said, there's no escape from challenges. And they help us, challenges help us to, to reach our highest potential. And you know, if, if you look at life, years ago, I read a survey that they took on who were the people that led the most successful lives. And so, you know, we could all, if we did it, we'd probably come up with, with all the same people. And, and those people had a couple of things in common, one of which is at some point in their life, they had, they had a goal, they had a dream, and nothing stopped them. There were things that might get in their way, but it didn't stop them. They faced some great obstacles. So, you know, some of the people, Jesus, you know, we all have read, you know, about Jesus in the garden when he knows what's going to happen. And he asks God, take this from me. And then says, no, not my will, your will. The Buddha grew up a very sheltered life, never saw his father kept him sheltered. And one day when he finally leaves, he escapes and he sees death and he sees illness, and he sees sick people, and old, you know, old and ill, he, he wants to do something. And so, you know, he sits under, he tries a lot of different ways, but sits under the Bodhi tree and says, I'm not moving until I become enlightened. Gandhi was an attorney and was trying to get on a train one day, and the conductor kicked him off because he had brown skin, and he had to spend the night in a cold, train station, and that's what transformed him and started him on, on his journey. You know, after, after Mother Teresa died, they, they published some, some letters that she had written and talked about how she had, throughout most of her life, crises of faith. And, you know, I won't keep going. Nelson Mandela, I forgot, what was he in, 27 years in prison. Um, so all of these people, um, that we look up to and think, wow, they really made the most of their lives. They did it by overcoming, by overcoming something. And, and Beckwith says, you know, when you pray, if you've got stuff going on in your life, don't pray that it gets removed. Pray instead that you have the power to meet, overcome, and grow from what's ever going on in your life, and, and we, we talked a little bit, I'm not sure how we got, got onto it, but we talked a little bit about it this week at, at the book group. And you know, I mentioned, you know, when I, one of my most difficult times in life was when I got divorced. You know, it's really tough, I had three kids, a wife, you know, and all of a sudden, your life is upside down. And you know, five years later, I meet somebody else and you know, becomes, the love of, of my life, even though she drives me crazy. Um, you know, people, people lose jobs. And go on, I did, you know, I got laid off when I worked for Mattel and it led me to start my own business and it was the best job next to being a minister that I ever had. The literature is full of examples of people that have grave illnesses and it turns their whole life around because they realize, they realize what's what's important in their life. And so Mary, Mary Morrissey um, writes about this, and, and she says, um, one of the things that we need when we have difficult times in our life, we need perspective. We need to be able to say, okay, here, here, this is going on in my life, but to be able to keep it in perspective. And so I want to 
want to give you, uh, read to you an example that, that Mary has in, in her book. <clears throat> it's a letter from a young woman who went off to college about 12 weeks before. And she writes, Dear Mom and Dad, Sorry I haven't written lately, but all my things were destroyed in the dorm fire. My eyes are almost completely healed now, and the doctor assures me there will be no permanent damage from the smoke. While the dorm is being rebuilt, I've moved in with my boyfriend. <laughs> I think you met him when uh, you were here for parents' weekend. I know how you've always wanted grandchildren, so you'll be happy to know I'm expecting this summer. <laughs> then it goes on. Please excuse this exercise in English composition. There was no dorm fire. My eyes are not damaged. I'm not living with my boyfriend, and I'm not pregnant. However, I did receive a D in English and an F in French, and I wanted to be sure you got this information in the proper perspective. <laughs> so, so imagine if you ever got a letter like that from your kid. You'd be, you know, you'd, need a, you'd have a heart attack after the first paragraph. But then after the second paragraph, it doesn't seem quite as bad. And that's, that's the point that, that Mary was, was uh, trying to make. We, we, need, we need to keep things in, in, per, in perspective. And one of the other points that she makes is that we need to stand for better rather than bitter. We need to stand for better rather than bitter. And, and her point is that, that it's God's will for us to have greater, greater good. So when we're having a difficult time, instead of staring at the door that's closed, she said, look at the window that's bringing in, bringing in light for you. And um, she, she talks about, I think that this is where I read it this week, but I've heard this before. Terry Cole Whitaker, you all have heard of her, she's a religious science minister. And Terry Cole Whitaker says um, that humans are different than rats in one particular way. She said, if you have a maze and you put a rat in the maze with a piece of cheese, the rat will go for the cheese. And if you keep putting the cheese in the same place, the rat will keep going. If after it does that for a while, if you take the cheese and you put it somewhere else in the maze, the rat will go to the first place and then it will start to smell around and it'll eventually find where the cheese is. And if you move the cheese again, it'll repeat the process. It'll go where the cheese was and then it'll look and find where the cheese is. She said, human beings don't do that. If we have stuff going on in our life, we keep going back to the same place, to the same place, and we go up figuratively to the roof and go, where the hell is my cheese? You know, we, we, don't, we don't seem to learn as quickly when we're having difficult, difficult times. And, and the truth is, we can't grow when we're feeling sorry for ourselves. Um, we can't grow when we remain stuck. And to me, one, one of the best examples um, that, that, I've, that I've heard about this is, um, you know, and, and it's a true story, two different women had their sons killed by drunk drivers. One of the women could never get over it and eventually became addicted. The second woman started Mothers Against Drunk Driving. You know, so how, how we deal with what we have is it can be very different. So I, I, I want to tell you another story. And it's about a, some young boys, who, a fable, who live in a town. And, the, and there's a wise man in the town. And boys, I guess, will be boys. So they decide they want, they want to fool the wise man. So they get a bird, and one of the kids has the bird in his hand, and it's behind his back. And the plan is, they're going to go to the wise man, and they're going to say, so we have this bird in our hand. Tell us, is the bird dead, or is the bird alive? 
And the plan is, if the wise man says the bird is alive, the kid's going to choke the life out of the bird and show it to him and say, see, you're wrong. The bird, I know, the bird's dead. And if the wise man says the bird is dead, they're going to take out this live bird and say, see, so you're not so wise. So they do get to, to meet with him, and they do what I just said, and they say, so what is it? And the wise man thinks for a while, and he says... The life you're holding is in your hands. The life you're holding is in your hands. And the point for me is the life that each of us is holding, our life is in our hands. It's up to us what we do with it and, and, how, and how we live it. So um, I was reading a blog by a fellow named Robert Burnett this week, and he said that at one time or another, every one of us has probably said this. See if you've ever, if, if you ever said it. If it weren't for blank, my life would be perfect. Anybody ever said that? If it weren't for blank, my life would be perfect. And, and he said the reason we say that is because we're looking in the wrong places. We're looking in the wrong places. We're looking externally for, for our happiness, and that's not where we find it. And he said, the how of your life is more important than the what of your life. The how of your life is more important than the what of your life. For instance, how are you living your life? How do you respond to what's in front of you? And what's in the way is the way. What's in the way is the way. And obstacles can become a stepping stone for us along our soul's journey. If, if we want to have more, we have to be more. And we get more by overcoming obstacles. And when we embrace, if we embrace this concept, we, we find the courage to, to move forward when troubles are knocking on our door. And one of the groups years ago that, that, that was very much into this are the Stoics. And I um, have a quote from Stoicism that, that's along this line. And the quote is, you will come across obstacles in life, fair or unfair. You will discover time and time again that what matters most is not what these obstacles are, but how we see them and how we react to them, and whether we keep our composure. So it's how, you know, everybody is saying that, that I've been talking about, how, how we face them, how we keep our composure, the kind of faith that we have, that, that we can learn and we can grow and we can be more from, from what's in, in our path. And obstacles, if you think about it, they don't stop us from reaching our goal they only change. They only change the path. And so, when I, when I was doing research this week on this topic, one of the people that's all over the literature that people quote is a guy named Robin Holiday, who wrote a book called "The Obstacle Is the Way." And believe it or not, I picked my title before I read that. Um, but but that's his book. And in, in there, he he compares obstacles to traffic signals to traffic lights. And he says, you know, so um, we don't take, when we're driving, we don't take a traffic light personally. I mean, if you took a traffic light personally, they, they'd lock you up, right? <laughs> um, and, and um, but we do take obstacles personally sometimes. And he said, so both of them, traffic signals and obstacles, basically in some way tell us the same thing. They say, stop, or 
this intersection is blocked. And when it does, you don't yell, right? You don't yell at the traffic signal, but we might at, at an obstacle. And he said, you know, um, we accept it. What we need to do is to accept it and don't let it prevent us from our final destination. <coughs> what we do is change the path, okay? So if we have an obstacle in our life, it doesn't have to change our dream or what we want. It's maybe instead of going straight, I need to make some left turns or some, some my, my GPS doesn't do it as much anymore but it would take me around the block rather than have me make a left turn. Uh, um, um, you know, we all get a hand to play and, and we need to play it as, as, best, as best we can. So I, I, want, to, um, I want to read um, two different letters, to, well, a letter and a story to you. Both of them come from a book called Guidance from the Darkness by Mary Murray Shelton who um, is a friend and was the dean of the School of Ministry when I went through and was a classmate of Reverend Jenner's, right? When you were going through the School of Ministry. So this is the book she wrote. And the first letter is a little long, but um, you'll see. So it starts off, Dear friend, I found this beautiful magazine in a dirty, run-down motel room. When I went into the room, I was an alcoholic and an addict. When I left, I was shining, clean, and free. I was free from my obsession from alcohol drug, and drugs. I was free for the first time in many years. My life before this consisted of being locked up in hospital wards, jails, and prisons several dozen times. One by one, I gave away four children. During one of my more desperate times of loneliness, I stole one of my children from her new mother. For this insanity, I was sent to prison for child stealing. I never knew what resentments were. What I felt was a deep hate for the whole world, but most of all, for myself. I felt guilty too. I knew what it was to be very lonely. The fears I had were many and some nameless. I made several attempts at suicide. That was my life until I found that beautiful Science of Mind magazine two years ago in that dirty little hotel room. I read the words that told me God's dwelling place is within man, that if I would still my thoughts, I would realize his presence. My friend, can you understand what those words meant to me? when I had given up the very desire to live. Those words made me realize that God and I had never been separated, that we would never be apart in this world or any other world. I felt fear leave me and a great stillness surrounded me. A river of peace flowed through me and streams of light broke through the darkness and shone through me. I was healed. That light has never left me. And each time I turn within to God's presence, I find the light steady and undimmed by time. I know this light is the love God has for man. May God bless you, my friend, and may he bless those wonderful people who wrote the words that started a chain of love. With love, Jane Doe. And I left some of it out, but the point the point for me is that she had to be willing. She read what she read, but she had to be willing to let go of the status quo and to see life in in a whole in a whole different in a whole different way. To get out of in some ways, even though it was uncomfortable where she was, that was her comfort zone, and she needed to be willing to get out of it. And the second one is much shorter. It's um, Mary was at a um, a woman of courage luncheon that was, um, I guess the, there was a radio program where a bunch of women were interviewed at different times and they had this luncheon for women in courage. And Mary said um, she was struck by a powerful, slender woman of color who stood up and said this, I am not a victim. There have only been blessings in my life. 
because in God there is nothing but blessings. So the incest was a blessing. The beatings were a blessing. The rape was a blessing. They have helped make me the woman I am today. And I am proud to be who I am. And, you know, I think the message there is on the other side of the obstacles is transformation, is empowerment, and is in growth. And it can be there for all of us. God bless you. Thank you for being here.